This is the Perfect Pup Podcast, helping you build a better relationship with your pup. Presented by Pupford. Hello, pup parents, and welcome to today's episode of the Perfect Pup Podcast. My name is Devin. We're going to dive into two terms and techniques and principles that you've maybe heard before, but are really valuable to understanding how we can more humanely and effectively change our dog's behaviors. We're going to talk about Lima dog training, and we are also going to talk about the humane hierarchy. This episode is a little bit more technical. It's truthfully, these two kind of principles are geared more towards the training professionals and behaviorists, but I think as a pup parent, it's really valuable to understand how the professionals are approaching things and and in turn, be more effective as trainers ourselves. Because at the end of the day, You might learn from a trainer, they might teach you how to teach your dog, but you are becoming the dog trainer for your puppy or dog. So let's get right into it. I will say first, there will be some opinion that bleeds into this episode. There usually is, but I know that when we talk about things like aversives and punishment-based techniques, it can get heated and there's a lot of people who have differing opinions. So I want to try to present it as methodically and as, I guess, level-headed as I can while still giving you my own insights and what I think is beneficial. So very first, before we talk about Lima and the humane hierarchy, we need to talk about animal welfare. And animal welfare essentially is the physical and psychological state of our dogs in this case, or any animal in general. So when we think about training and raising our dogs, we need to have their welfare as part of our thought process. Are they happy? Are they safe? Are they feeling stressed? Do they have the freedom to choose? And that leads into Lima. So you may hear a dog trainer say that they follow the Lima protocol, which stands for least intrusive, minimally aversive. So let's break down those two pieces. Least intrusive, you can think of something that is intrusive as it fringes on or inhibits the dog's ability to make choices and have freedom. So for example, if you are using a technique where you're, you know, pinning your dog into a corner until they do something that you want them to, do they have choice? Do they have freedom? They're being intruded on their space, their ability to choose their freedom is being intruded upon. And then minimally aversive. You can think of something that is aversive as a stimulus like a shock or a spray or a harsh punishment that is done to decrease the likelihood of a behavior occurring. You may be familiar with things like e-collars or choke chains, but it can also be, you know, spraying your dog with a water bottle when they bark. That is technically an aversive. And so with Lima, it is finding minimally aversive things. And that the word minimal is key because it means that they're can be some aversives and we'll get to that more. Really, when you boil down Lima dog training, you are looking at putting the learner first. And in this case, the learner is our dog. We know what we want them to do. We want them to not bark or walk by our side. They are learning how to do this. And so we are trying to find ways with Lima to let them learn and choose and decide for themselves and to be comfortable while doing it which is putting the learner first. When we talk about aversives, and we're gonna dive more into this, we need to understand a really important principle. I got Tracy Madsen's help with this episode and article. Uh, She's a dog trainer with over 20 years of experience. She originally started as someone who used aversives and now does not. And she really wanted me to kind of hammer home the point that the learner chooses what's aversive as well as what is reinforcing. Just because we think something isn't that bad or isn't aversive, the dog decides what is aversive to them. For example, one dog may not be bothered at all by a gentle correction on the leash, but another dog, it might be really bothersome to them and it might cause them stress and anxiety and fear. And in turn, it would make that aversive. You'll often hear people who use e-collars saying, oh, I only use the vibration or the beep. And while that's maybe better than the shock, what if the vibration is aversive to your dog? What if it scares them? What if it causes them fear? 
that means it is an aversive. And the same thing goes for reinforcers. Just because you think like, oh, my dog's a retriever. They should love the ball. The ball playing fetch or throwing a ball should be a reinforcer for them, but it might not be. And so we, as the pup parent and as the teacher, we need to find out what is number one, aversive for our dogs, and number two, what is reinforcing. The big key for doing that is to learn about dog body language and stress signals. I think if I could go back to when I first became a pup parent and really focus in on one thing, it would be learning about dog body language because as I have progressed in my knowledge and experience with dogs, learning about how they speak to us has been one of the most important ways that I've learned how to interact and speak with them and keep them safe and comfortable and going back to animal welfare in a positive psychological state. So learn about dog body language, read articles. We have courses at Pupford that cover dog body language. Go to a dog park, maybe without your dog and just watch dogs. I mean, don't be weird about it, but like watch dogs and how they interact and try to get as much experience as you can. When you're walking your dog in the park or, you know, you're out with multiple dogs, watch how they interact, make notes of it, you know, look at their tail, look at their ears, look at how they, you know, do play bows and those type of things. Really learning about dog body language is how you're going to be able to make informed decisions about this Lima protocol. You will be able to understand what is the least intrusive and the minimally aversive techniques because you will be able to read how your dog is reacting and handling the situation. So Lima is more of like an ethos and a mindset, but it doesn't necessarily say you should do X, Y, and Z technique. You should try luring or shaping, or you should use positive reinforcement. That's where the humane hierarchy comes in. And the humane hierarchy is more of an action plan. If you think of your dog's behavior, and there's a graphic that's popular for the humane hierarchy where it's a car driving down a freeway, and there's six different exits for the car to get off of. And you're starting at step one with the, in theory, most basic or simple exit, and not until you get to the very end, after you've tried all these other exit points with your training, do you get to things like punishment or aversives. So the very first step, I'll go through these quickly and then we'll give some examples. The first one is your dog's wellness, their health, their well-being, their physical health. The second is antecedent arrangements. The third is positive reinforcement. The fourth is differential reinforcement of alternative behaviors. The fifth is a a clumping of multiple things together, and those are extinction, negative punishment, and negative reinforcement. And then the very last stop on this off-ramp choice of training is positive punishment. So let's look at each of those in a little bit more detail. I'm going to use a very common behavior that many of us have probably dealt with, and that is you're in your house and your dog is barking at noises or things that it sees outside. And that is frustrating and frankly, quite annoying sometimes. So let's talk about how you can apply the humane hierarchy to this reactive barking to things that are outside your home. So going to step one, looking at your dog's wellness, their physical well-being, their health. Ask yourself, when's the last time you went to your vet? Is your dog having an illness that could be making them more reactive or more frustrated or whatever it might be? Are their dietary needs being met? Are they healthy? And importantly as well, in this step one, you would look at, is your dog getting their physical and mental exercise needs met? In so many instances, our dogs are going to bark more if they're bored, if they haven't been exercised, if they haven't had a chance to use their brain. So that's step one is just looking at your dog's overall health and well-being. Once you're clear there, you take that first off-ramp, you can go to the second step, and that is antecedent arrangements. Again, this is looking at your dog's environment, the setting, the basically exposure to these stimulus that could be cueing them to do a behavior you don't want. So again, with that barking example, I remember in our house we used to live in, we had this a front a window in our bedroom that looked out the front of our house, the way our house was set up. And we almost always had the blinds closed and curtains over it because it was our bedroom. We liked it dark where we were sleeping. And sometimes we would open that window up and without fail, 
Scout, our dog, would just go sit in the window and just sit and stare and people would walk by and we and she would bark. And so how do you limit that? You know, looking at antecedent arrangements, it's like, how do you how do you not give your dog access to certain things that are going to trigger or cause these problem behaviors? And in this case of barking at things that they can see outside, it can be as simple as just having the blinds closed or having curtains. If your dog can't see the things that are causing them to bark, they are much less likely to bark. And additionally, with this barking example in particular, it is so troublesome because if your dog continues to see someone outside, they bark, they bark, they bark, and then the person is gone, which they're likely going to be going, right? Like they're just passing by or delivering mail or picking up trash or whatever it is. When your dog barks at that person and then they leave, they were just reinforced because in their mind, someone came onto their territory, they barked, they believe in their dog brain that the barking caused the person to leave. And so they're going to think, hey, next time I see a person, I'm going to bark again because I got the other person to leave. And so if you continue to give them exposure to that, they're going to continue to bark. So that would be step two is just how can you rearrange the situation or you know your dog's access to their triggers that are causing them to perform these problem behaviors? After you've done that, you're going to move on to step three. And step three and four are kind of done in tandem, but they are, step three is positive reinforcement, which many of us are very familiar with. It's adding a reinforcer, something enjoyable for your dog that is going to increase the likelihood of a behavior occurring. And then that step four is differential reinforcement of alternative behaviors. So for example, with the dog barking at the window, what you can do is you can teach your dog when they see something, you know, again, this is going to take practice, patience, repetition, but if you set up a training session and your dog sees something walking by and it barks and you can teach them and train them to come to their place. So an alternative behavior, right? If they are not looking out the window, they're not going to see the trigger and they're not going to be able to bark in theory. They're going to come to their place. Again, this takes time. I'm overly simplifying it, but the alternative behavior of going to their place. And then once they're there in their place, you give them a very strong reinforcer. You give them some positive reinforcement like a treat or ideally a long lasting chew or a frozen Kong, you know, something that is retraining their brain to say, hey, I saw something instead of barking. I'm going to learn over time to go to my place and I'm going to get things that are going to make me want to stay in my place. I know I oversimplified that, but you can see how over time you are retraining the stimulus of someone walking by to be associated with an alternate behavior. And by positively reinforcing the alternate behavior, you increase the likelihood of it occurring. If that's still not working, you can move into step five. So step five is techniques that truthfully are a bit more complicated. And like I said, this humane hierarchy is is employed by trainers and behaviorists and professionals, but it's it's beneficial to learn as everyday pup parents. So step five is going to be the grouping of extinction, negative punishment, and negative reinforcement. So extinction essentially is you are never giving that reinforcer again. And this is a bit more complicated than that, but you know, think if your dog is begging, every time you give them something when they beg, you're reinforcing it. So ex extinction would be Again, I'm oversimplifying, but never giving any food from the table again. And eventually over time, you know, your dog might try harder and harder to get those table scraps. But if you hold strong and never give them a reinforcer, they eventually will stop. Negative punishment, that is taking something away to decrease a behavior. So if your dog has a toy and they do something that you don't want or they're outside and they behave in a certain way, like barking through the fence, you bring them back inside, you take away access to said enjoyable thing, negative is taking away, and punishment is something that is to decrease the likelihood. So you take away access to the toy or to being outside, and, in and it's going to decrease the likelihood of that reoccurring in the future. The other one is negative punishment on the little bit more com complicated side, but one that is often used as, as an example is if a dog were pulling on the leash, you pull the, a choke chain or a slip collar tight until the dog stops pulling. And then when they stop, you release. And that would be negative reinforcement because you are removing something that is aversive in this case to reinforce and make it more likely that, you know, they realize, okay, 
something bad was happening to me and then I stopped pulling and then the bad things stopped. Again, it's a little more complicated and it's not something that you're gonna use very frequently, but it's good to learn to understand what it is. After all of that, so after steps one through five, you've tried all these things, you've practiced, you've put in the time and effort. And I'm not talking like one session. I'm saying you are applying these techniques on a frequent basis and really honing in and practicing it with your dog. Still then, the last step, again, emphasis, the very last step on the humane hierarchy is then positive punishment. That would be, for example, your dog barks, you give them a shock on an e-collar to decrease the likelihood of that behavior happening again. Let's make a point here, right? I believe, and my how I approach raising my dogs is to try to stay as much as you can in steps one through four. And with this example, you know, that I got from Tracy about the barking, she emphasized that the vast majority of cases that she deals with, with her clients are solved with steps one through four. You're probably going to mix in some negative punishment again, where you're taking something away you know, the negative to decrease the likelihood of something happening again, you know, your dog is outside, they bark at the neighbors, they come inside, negative punishment to decrease the likelihood. But again, her point was that the vast majority of cases can be solved with one through four. So hopefully you can see how these kind of two points, these two principles of Lima, least intrusive, minimally aversive, and the humane hierarchy are very intertwined. And really the important thing to remember is that, again, we are trying to find techniques and ways that keep our animals' welfare as a top priority while also changing behaviors. Because at the end of the day, we have to do that as pup parents. If we don't train our dogs, they will do behaviors that will cause massive problems in our lives and the lives of people around us. So we have to train them. We have to change behaviors, but it's approaching it in a methodical humane and while still effective way. I do want to make one other point here about aversives. The person who kind of originally coined Lima, his name was Stephen R. Lindsay. And I want to, I'm going to look down and read a quote to what he said, because it may seem counterintuitive to look at, you know, okay, Lima, it feels like not doing any punishment with your dog. And that's not necessarily the point, because again, in the humane hierarchy, there is opportunity where it may be necessary, but I want to make a point here. So he said, when properly understood and employed, electrical stimulation, think an e-collar, can be effectively used to modify dog behavior without eliciting significant stress or fear. The point that's important, the key words there is when properly understood and employed. And this is where I'm going to get into some opinion and a little bit of a rant here. Just bear with me. There are a lot of dog trainers out there who employ a wide variety of methods. The challenge that I see is a lot of proponents of e-collars or choke chains or prong collars, while they are experts and they likely have years of experience and they've gone to trainings and seminars and they've worked under other trainers who have more experience than them and they've put in hours and hours, hundreds of hours of training with these tools, they may understand how to use them, but what happens when a new pup parent goes to one of these trainers and they say, hey, I want you to use an e-collar. You maybe are meeting once a week for four to eight weeks for about an hour. So, you know, even on the high end of that, we're saying roughly eight, maybe 10 hours of training experience on how to use an e-collar. Does that really make someone an expert? And even according to Stephen Lindsay's definition, does that mean that this pup parent properly understands and can properly implement the use of an aversive like an e-collar? I'd argue no. I look back at myself when I was a brand new pup parent, my level of knowledge was like finite compared to what it is now. I'm not an expert. I don't know everything, but I know a lot more now than I did then. And I look back and I think, wow, if someone had put an e-collar in my hand when I'm dealing with puppy behaviors that are oftentimes frustrating, challenging, would I have been able to think and act clearly and in a quote unquote effective way with those tools? Probably not. So I think for people who want to be proponents of e-collars, you may or may not even be listening to this. If you are, thank you for listening. 
And if you're thinking of putting an e-collar on your dog or a choke chain or a prong collar, ask yourself, do you have the level of expertise to employ that in a humane and effective way? That's the problem with aversives is that more often than not, they are being used by people who frankly don't understand how to use them. And you might say, well, a lot of people don't understand how to use positive reinforcement, but they still do it. And here's the thing, using positive reinforcement, well, there are levels of efficacy in being better at it. Rewarding your dog is likely not going to cause them fear, anxiety, and stress. And that's the problem with aversives is that in the wrong hands, they can cause those things. And they, there are studies that have shown that aversive techniques increase the likelihood of stress signals, of anxiety, of fear, and potentially create more problem behaviors in the long run. So my personal opinion, my feeling is that using aversives, while it's the very last step on the humane hierarchy and it should be done minimally as prescribed by Lima, it's often not the best choice for our dogs. And if you feel like you really have tried all these other steps, all the five preceding steps on the humane hierarchy, and you're like, I don't know what to do, at least get a professional involved who still follows Lima and the humane hierarchy and can safely and effectively implement those tools. My goal as part of this podcast and the topics that I choose is to help pup parents raise well-mannered dogs that stay in their home forever. That's what I want. I know the joy that dogs bring. I know the bond that we can have with our dogs. And unfortunately, sometimes when people use aversives too frequently, it causes irreparable or very challenging to repair damage for our dogs. And additionally, it is my opinion, but it is rooted in a lot of research in many hours of studying and learning my own firsthand experience, as well as having many face-to-face -face conversations with multiple dog trainers, many of whom used to use aversives and who now don't because they have learned the challenges and problems that can come with them. So I hope you learned something in this episode. Again, Lima, least intrusive, minimally aversive. It's kind of an ethos. It's a mindset. It's how do we keep our dog's welfare at the top priority? And how do we put the learner first? And we often do that by following the humane hierarchy and looking at things like their health, their wellness, the environment and the things that are happening to them, and then working on alternative behaviors and positive reinforcement before moving on to other tech. Techniques. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts, share it with a friend. If you're on YouTube, subscribe, leave a comment. And other than that, we will catch you on the next episode. Wow.